to season 5 of my podcast. Today, my guest is Sumbal Wakas, a postgraduate in finance who has experience working in the banking sector as well as being a lecturer in Lahore School of Economics. Hi, Sumbal. Welcome to my show. Hello, my curious little friend. It's such a pleasure to be here. You know, I'm a big fan of your podcast and I really enjoy listening to the diversity of your topics and the amazing people that you have on your podcast. My recent favorite was listening to Rajat Oja. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. And learning about the metaverse. It was so interesting. Yeah, even I learned a lot from that interview. All right, brilliant. So I'm excited to do this interview. And let's start. So Sumbal, okay. so Sumbal you have studied finance. I understand that finance is everything linked to money. Can you tell me more about what studying finance means? Yes, of course I can. Um, it is correct to say that, that the heart and soul of finance lies within the one and only thing. That's money. Money matters. That cash is king. So broadly, if we talk about finance, there are different aspects, areas, or branches of it. You can say that the nuts and bolts of finance mainly cover subject areas like investments and portfolio management, where you can see which financial assets you have to hold, buy, sell, which financial institutions you can put your money or your savings in, in order to grow your money. While you look at different risk factors, the economy, is it going up? Is it going down? You can also look at different aspects such as valuation. For example, if there is a company, how do you know how much that company is worth? Right? Or different financial assets. For example, if you've heard about shares, stocks, bonds, how do you know how much they're worth? That all boils down to valuation and finance. Other things can be like corporate finance. Now, this area is one of my favorites. Um, This will deal with, for example, if there's an organization or a firm that wants to run, they don't have money. Where do they get the money from? So that's a very important aspect to look at. What are the risk factors? How is it going to impact them? Other aspects can be like financial accounting. So I know there is accounting, but then there is financial accounting. So accounting is just looking at numbers. Um, Where is the money coming in from? Where is it going out to? But financial accounting looks at these numbers through a financial lens. Like how do you manage your assets and liabilities of an organization? Other things that you can do is after, for example, your post-grad, if you're interested in finance and want to take it a notch higher and want to specialize in certain aspects, you can actually do certain certifications or acquire them. For example, certifications like CFA, which is a chartered financial analyst. Again, very specialized, um, will put you out there in the financial market or things like FRM financial risk manager. Again, it's a niche. Uh, You learn about risk in finance, but these things in combination really make you a master in finance. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it did. You said that when you learn finance, you also learn about risk, right? Yes, that's correct. What kind of risks are involved in finance? So there are different types of risk. Um, Risk, when you talk about risk in finance, that particularly means a loss. For example, if you've, you know, like really worked hard and earned money and saved money, for example, let's say as small as $100, um, the risk for that $100 will be if you lose part or all of it. So what you want to do with your saving is that you want to grow it, right? So if it's $100, you want to make it more than $100. How you can do that is by investments. Now, where do you invest now? There are so many different financial institutions. 
we talked about, for example, banks. Now, there is not just one bank in the market out there. You have a lot of different banks. Now, there are different risk profiles associated to banks. So, for example, if it's a bank that you know, like DBS, it's a big bank, it's a known bank, you know that bank, risk might be lower. But, for example, if there's a new bank that opens up, it's smaller, no one really knows about it. So would you be comfortable investing your $100 in that small bank? Most probably not, right? So that's the risk that's associated to just a bank, for example. Now, there are different financial institutions out there in the market that you can invest in. So that's the risk that you need to look at. If I invest my hard-earned, hard-saved $100, what's the risk that I will lose it? Those are the things that you need to look at. So there are a lot of factors involving within risk, but I'm just telling you the very basic one. Wow. I didn't know there were so many risks involved in just giving money to a bank. Yes, that is correct. That's just the basic definition. Um, there are different um, aspects or branches of risks as well. Um, but again, that's the very basic definition. I know that people store their money in a bank and also take loans from the bank. How does banking work if I have put my money in the bank and someone else taking money from there as a loan? Okay, so let's look at the core banking activity for this question. So we're talking about banking 101 here. Um, how does a bank uh, essentially make money, right? So the core business of a bank involves the banks to give out money or loans to people or institutions. So it's just not at an individual level. It can be people like you and me, or big organizations, or even small, medium enterprises. So essentially people who are in need of money, the borrowers. So the borrowers, they borrow the money, they have to pay back the money that they borrowed after a certain predetermined time. Plus, they have to pay a cost for borrowing that money. Now, the cost of borrowing the money is known as the interest rate, all right? On the other hand, the other part of the banking operations is that they accept deposits, meaning they take money in from people. If we look at it from our perspective, like from an individual level, we can keep money with the bank for several reasons. Number one reason would be maybe safety, right? So maybe I'm not comfortable carrying a lot of money in my pocket. Uh, maybe it's stolen. Or I'm not comfortable with leaving money at home for the same reason that I might not feel that it's safe. Other times, people have excess money but do not have the financial know-how of where to invest. And the most common financial institution that people know of is a bank. So if you ask anyone on the street about financial institutions, most of them will say they know what a bank is rather than other institutions, like for example, an asset management firm. All right, so if you don't have the financial know-how, but you have excess money, you can actually go to a bank and deposit your money. So I can go to a bank, deposit money for safety reasons or because I wanna invest. So if I'm creating an account with a bank and depositing money over there, the bank will reward me for putting or placing my money with them. Now that reward will be my returns. Those returns are also interest payments. So essentially, we gain returns via the interest paid or the interest payments on the amount of money that we have deposited or invested within the bank. Now, coming to your question. So that's the core operation of a bank. Coming to your question, where the banks take our money to give out loans, banks effectively take money from people who are willing to deposit money with them. And for that, the banks reward them with returns. So this is something that we've established. Now the money that's put in within the deposits are utilized by the bank 
and they are rolled out as loans. So that's a term that they will use, that they will roll out your deposits um, as loans to institutions or corporations or individuals who are willing to borrow that money. And banks, in turn, of course, charge them for using that money. They charge them with the interest rates. So um, what happens over here is um, either they can roll out the money as loans and gain interest from people or institutions, or they can utilize the money and invest it somewhere else. Again, the bottom line is to earn returns from that. Now, how does the bank make a profit from that? The bank makes profits via the difference between the lending and the borrowing, which is called their spreads. So the money that they are getting from loaning out the money versus the returns that they have to pay to the deposit holders. So the difference between that is called the spreads. That's what the banks do essentially. That's how they make the profits. Now, of course, that's not the only thing that the bank does, but that's the core activity of a bank. That's the definition of a bank. But they also deal with different commodities that are available in the financial market um, that can be looked into. But again, this is the basic banking. You can say banking 101. I hope that answered the questions. It did. It did very much. Thank you. When, Great, awesome. Now, when bank when banks take interest rate when people borrow their money, like take out loans, does that interest rate go as the reward which the bank gives to people who deposit money? Okay, so if for example, what you can do is um, today as um, just a curious thing, so you can look at different banks in Singapore that are available, right? Every bank has a website and it's really thorough. So you will see that the interest that they give out on loans versus the interest rates that they give out on deposits will be different. For example, if there's a bank and they're giving out a 4% interest on loans, right? And they're also giving 4% interest on deposits, Essentially, they cannot make profits like that. So they charge higher on loans and give out lower rewards to the deposit holders so that the bank can make money. Again, the other thing is different banks might have different interest rates that they charge to a person. For example, if you go, uh, Mr. Vedant, to the bank, right? And if you, they'll look at your portfolio or your profile. So they'll see how much is your salary? Um, how much is your income? Have you borrowed before? So essentially, they're determining your risk profile. How risky are you as a person to the bank? Now, what does risk mean in this case? It will mean that what is the likelihood that you don't pay the bank back? So you take out a loan, but you say, oh my goodness, I can't pay you back anymore. I'm sorry. So they're trying to determine that. If they think you're a risky person, they're going to charge you a higher interest rate. So they'll charge you more. If you're not a very risky person, maybe for that person, the interest rate might be a bit lower. They can also have different clients, for example. So if it's a big client bringing in a lot of money, maybe they get a better deal with the bank off a lower interest rate. So there, again, there are a lot of factors that the bank has to look at. The base rate might be the same, but then the calculation of risk plus other factors might change the interest rate. But the thing that they charge, the interest that they charge on a loan versus the interest that they have to give on a deposit will be different because they need to earn money from that. You said that based on the person's risk profile, it's yes. sometimes it's like a higher interest rate or lower interest rate. If the person's yes. risk factor is very high and yes. they charge more money, I why do they do that? Because 
if, if the person does pay back the interest rate, then it would be bad for them. Whereas if they give a 1% interest rate instead of a 4, then even if they don't pay that back, it wouldn't be so bad for the bank. So when you um, learn finance, the first rule of finance that you will learn is high risk, high returns. So what that means is if a person is risky or an investment is risky, you will only invest in that person or that financial asset or that institution if it gives you higher returns. So for example, Mr. Vedant, if you are a risky person, the bank will be charging you a higher return to compensate for the risk that they are taking. Otherwise, there is no point of giving you a loan at a lower interest rate, knowing that there is a likelihood that you will not pay them back. This is called compensation for the risk. On the other hand, banks also have collaterals, right? So even if you're risky, they will ask for a higher collateral. Plus, uh, they will want to make more money out of risky, um, again, investments. Because for banks, giving out loans is how they make money. They give out loans, they make interest rates on that. So if you're risky, they should make more returns from you. So that's again, so just learn this basic rule. Finance, high risk means high returns or high rewards. Otherwise, no one's going to invest in that. What happens if you don't pay back a loan? Example, if I go to a bank and take a, like a, a $100 loan, what happens if I don't pay that back? Okay, so the banks are very smart in this case. Banks do not operate without knowing your profile, knowing your risk level, and they will also back themselves up. How do they back themselves up? Is by something called a collateral. Now, a collateral can be anything. For example, it can be your car. It can be your house. It can be um, jewelry that you own, right? depending, of course, on the amount of loan that you're taking out. So they will take collateral from you um, plus minus the value of the loan. For example, um, if you're taking out a $100 loan, and let's say it's a very hypothetical example, let's say you have a ring with you that's also somewhat worth $100, okay? So you will write to the bank. In case I do not or I cannot pay back the loan, what will happen is you will keep my ring, my gold ring. And in case you actually do not, the bank will come to your home. They will get their ring from you and they can just go to the market, sell your ring, get their money back. And in that scenario, what happens is not only do you lose your ring, but you also lose all of the interest payments that you've already pay to the bank. So again, getting a loan from a bank is not like an easy thing or an easy task. If you don't pay, like how you said, if you still don't give the collaterals and they come to your house, what happens if you just move houses? Okay, so in extreme scenarios, what happens is that they can come and they can repossess any of your assets that you own. So if they find out where you live in case you don't uh, move houses, so they will come to your house, they will possess something that's worth $100, and then they will basically sell that, get their money. In case you want to run off, then the police will be involved, the court will be involved, the law will be involved. They will find you and they will still either get that money out from you somehow by selling any of your possessions that you hold or you serve jail time, unfortunately. Well, I don't think yep. anybody should <laughs> run away. They should just give the collateral or even better, just pay the bank. Or they can, the better thing is, 
only go for the bank loans if you know you can or are able to pay them off. Because there have been incidences, especially if you read about different cases, uh, where taking out loans, simple loans from banks, have actually put people in much worse conditions. They've built up more debt. (laughs) So it can be quite tricky. Only go for that if you are sure you are able to pay it back. Otherwise, it can be quite um, a difficult scenario. You spoke a little bit about interest rate a bit earlier in this episode. Can you tell us a bit more about it? Yes, of course I can. So again, with the previous to previous question, when we were talking about the banking activity, I told you about the interest rates again. So I'm going to talk about interest rates in the very basic finance 101 matters. All right. So we'll touch a little bit upon the economy as well. But let's begin with finance 101 interest rates. So basically, interest is the reward or return that you get when you invest your savings or excess money with an institution, such as a bank. Or on the other side, interest is the cost of borrowing money from an institution, such as a bank. Now, again, there are different financial institutions out there. But I'm going to quote a bank because it's the most common one that a layman understands. All right. So the interest is paid as a percentage of the money you invest or borrow. For example, if the if you have savings of $100 and the interest is 4%, right? So you invest $100 in a bank, you deposit, so let's say you have a current saving account, you deposit $100 within them, and the bank is very kind, and they're giving you a 4% return on that. So 4% of $100 will be calculated. So you're actually making $4 return. Similarly, on the other hand, if you borrow $100, and let's say the bank is charging you 4% as the cost of borrowing. So you will be paying 4% on the principal amount, which is $100 in this case. So again, you have to pay periodically, whatever the terms and conditions are with the bank, $4 till the maturity of the loan. So till you do not pay back the $100 to the bank, you will keep on paying $4 till the majority. So the interest rates can vary depending on the economic situation within the country, how risky the institution is, right? So again, finance and risk are working hand in hand. Um, Risk is a very big factor in finance. So even in the first question, if you do FRM as a certification, That's the mastery that you hold in the risk aspect of finance. Um, Other factors can be the length of your investment or borrowing. And these are only a few um, things that I'm mentioning that can impact um, the interest rates. The interest rates, you can say, are one of the most important aspects of an economic system. They influence the cost of borrowing. For example, if you need a loan or a personal loan for your studies or for buying a car, like you want to finance a car, or if you want to buy a house, mortgage a house, higher interest rates in this case will not be a favorable scenario to you because you will be paying more to the bank to acquire something that you need. On the other hand, for the return on savings, A higher interest rate in this scenario is very favorable for you. If the interest rates are high, that means if you invest within the bank, you will get higher returns. So you can say interest rates are a like a double-edged sword. So at one 
point, um, with higher interest rates, the cost of borrowing will be higher. But on the other side, um, it will reap you higher returns as well. Um, it can also save you in, from inflation. So interest rates being high, investing can save you from inflation as well. Now, a question that you can ask me over here is that um, who determines the interest rates, right? Um, that would be a very good question. So for a country, the interest rates are normally decided by central banks. Um, central banks are looking into the interest rates and there are different variables um, that will be involved into deterring the interest rates. Again, it's a bit complex um, above the basic level. So I'm not gonna go into that in detail, but again, just for general knowledge, usually central banks of a country determine the interest rates. For example, in the USA, so you've been there. So in the USA, the Federal Reserve is a central bank, or as they call it, the Fed, that's responsible for setting the interest rates. In Singapore, for example, uh, we have the Monetary Authority of Singapore that decides the interest rates. So the interest rates are very important. They can be a mechanism to stabilize the economy. Um, again, this is a whole different chapter. It is quite complicated and involves a lot of complex financial jargon. But again, just a gist of how important the interest rates are. Well, that sounds super important. I mean, I learned so much from that. Earlier, I That's just fantastic. Thought, uh, earlier, I just thought interest rate was you ask money from a bank, you need to give it in return. But now I've learned it's much more than that. All right, well done. Can a bank go bankrupt? Yes, they can. Um, there have been incidences in the past as well. If banks go bankrupt, that's another thing that the central bank, uh, so the central bank has different job roles. Uh, for example, one of them we've already talked about, so they deal with the interest rates. Another one is that they act as what's called as the lender of last resort. Um, in this scenario, what they do is if a bank is facing issues or problems or it's at the brink or verge of bankruptcy, they do step in to help out that bank. But um, in essence, yes, a bank can go bankrupt. Again, that's, again, dealing with the riskiness of a bank. Remember when we spoke about the risk profile? Yes. So when you are giving um, your money to a bank, one thing that you do worry about is, will, uh, what's the likelihood of me not getting my money back? And that is a scenario that can happen. For example, again, like I said, that if there is a new bank, a small bank, a bank that you have not heard about yet, but it is operating, the risk will be higher. And if it does not um, turn into profitability for the bank, then that can be, you know, disastrous. Um, and in the past, there have been incidences. And again, if you do finance, you will be doing case studies on those things as well. That why did they go bankrupt? Why was there a bank run? What happened? What did the central banks do, et cetera, et cetera, again. It's a bit complex, uh, a lot of financial jargon and feuds and mechanisms involved. But just to answer your question, yes, that can happen. So when the lesson to learn is when you're investing, you have to do your homework as well. You need to find out um, which institution you're investing in. What's their risk profile? You know, like how they do it for you. They find out how risky you are you do the same for them. How risky are they for you when you're investing? That's funny. It's basically like you doing what they do to you. Yes, that's correct. So when you're investing, yes, you do. Yeah, like a taste of their own medicine. <laughs> yes, you can say that. But the kinder way, not the other way. <laughs> yes. 
So that means, example, if I've given my hundred dollars to a bank and then that bank goes bankrupt, will example in Singapore case the MAS will they give me back the money? Okay, so usually what banks do is that there is insurance that the banks take out on the deposit holder's accounts. So the insurance will not pay you back the entirety of your money, but hopefully you will get some part of your money back. So usually deposit holders are insured um, up to a certain percentage. And uh, in case of bankruptcy, or if the bank gets robbed, for example, um, the insurance company do uh, step in and then they do give your money back. So, for example, in the U.S., if I'm not forgetting from the finance that I learned back in the day, it's called the FDIC insurance that covers the deposit holders. I'm not sure about Singapore here, but again, um, usually deposit holders are um, insured up to a certain percentage again. <laughs> so I guess everybody who knows that can be a, a bit less worried about not giving their money back. Yes, but still, we should do our homework. Yep. Why is money so important in our lives? Ah, uh, my little curious friend, that's such an important question. Well, money makes the world go round, and I 100% believe in that quotation. If you look at this historically, the concept of money has been around for about 5,000 years in one form or another. So throughout history, the way that we have conducted transactions have evolved from the early system of bartering to the now money that we know of. This is a very essential commodity. So it's not even deemed as important but it should be considered as a necessity to sustain a decent living. Money can be looked at from an individual perspective because this commodity allows us to make, meet our basic needs and necessities. So basic, I mean something like food, clean water, shelter, education, health care, these are all utilities um, essential for our well-being in a society. And of course, if your money grows, so does your lifestyle, your luxuries, your living standard. So yes, money is very important. If you look at it from a broader angle, money is a commodity that makes the economy of a country stronger. Uh, just to give you an example. So if... Um, an enterprise or an organization or a firm, they have money in a country, they can obtain capital or they can buy capital. With that, they can improve their, for example, technology. They can grow, they can expand. And if most of the enterprises in a country do that, what will happen? As a resultant, that will stimulate the economy in a positive, stronger manner. So yes, the world that we live in today, money is very important. It's a very powerful tool and a necessity in today's day and age. In one of my earlier seasons, I interviewed Padma Rangan, who is also a banker, and she told me about the history of money and the barter system. Oh, cool. I would love to uh, revisit her as well in your podcast. Yeah, it was in one of my earlier seasons. That's awesome. I will go through that today. I have heard that people make fake money. How do we identify if the notes we have are true currency or fake? Again, that is correct. Fake money does exist, unfortunately. Now, fake money is called counterfeit money. And of course, it's completely illegal. So how can you get fake money? Number one, sometimes you get fake money is by printing out fake money. And they try, the people who do that try their level best to imitate, copy the real money. But it is uh, next to impossible to do that. 
Number two, what they do is they sometimes get hold of real money. They bleach that. So they will get a lower um, denomination of money. For example, a $2 bill, a $5 bill. They will bleach that bill and they will alter it to look like a higher value note. So for example, bleach a $2 bill, try to make it like a $100 bill. So that's another methodology that they adopt. All right, now how can you spot fake money? So you need to understand when a, a country is going through a massive problem about counterfeit money, usually the banks and the government do create awareness about this. Okay, so then people are more cautious and whenever they're handling money, especially larger values of denominations of money, they take a few steps to ensure that they have the right note and not a counterfeit note. A few steps that I can tell you that you can also utilize are um, number one is the light test. So there are a few things that you should be able to spot uh, when you hold your note up to the light. Maybe, or um, I'm sure at one point in your life, you might have experienced this phenomenon when you might have given a bigger note to a shopkeeper. And the shopkeepers usually, you know, what they do is they feel the note with their hand. After feeling it, they'll put it up to a light to see some things. Um, especially for the higher value or denomination of money. So with the light test, you should be able to spot three things. Number one, look for a hologram. Now, if you see the money, for example, the Singaporean money, they have a face printed on it, right? So the face that's printed on the money or on the respective bill should match um, the hologram that's also printed on the money. If they both match, that means that um, your note is A-OK. -okay. Now, how does this work? Because remember I told you about the bleaching problem? So if you bleach out the money, the hologram is still going to be there, but the face will be bleached out. So if they bleach it into a higher value of that note, um, the face and the hologram are not going to match, okay? Number two, the thing that you should look at when you look at it into the light is something called a vertical strip. Now, the vertical strip has different um, denominations of the currency that you should be able to see and sort of read when you hold a note up to a light. So it's a very thin um, line that goes through the note and you should be able to see that. So number one is a hologram. You should see that and that should match the face that's printed on the note. Number two, you should see the vertical strip on the note. Number three is a something called a watermark. Now the watermark is embedded into the bill and it should be visible from both sides of the note. Again, if it's not visible, then it means what you're holding, my friend, is a counterfeit money. So just summing it up over here for the light test, um, these three things should be there uh, mostly in all of the currencies that are printed um, globally. Okay, another test that you can do is the ultraviolet light test. So again, it's a light, but the UV light. Now with the UV light, what happens is that if you put the note under the UV light, um, certain denominations of the currency glow under the light uh, um, in different color. So for example, I'm just giving you a hypothetical example. So if it's a $2 bill, if you hold it under the UV light, it might glow yellow. If it's a $5 bill, it might glow green um, and so on and so forth. Um, what else can I tell you about this? Okay, so for example, a Singapore note, it's uh, under the UV light, different things glow. Um, so you will see the seal of the note glowing, the denomination glowing, the serial number will glow. And um, another thing that the Singaporean currency has are something called uh, fluorescent. Um, 
things in there. So there are small fluorescent specks in the currency. They will also glow. So there are fibers. So if all of those things are glowing, you know for sure that the Singaporean currency is real. So you should be able to see the watermark. You should be able to see the vertical strip, the hologram. You should see the glow of different colors under the UV light. Um, you should be able to see for Singaporean currency, different things glow under the UV light. You should be able to see the fluorescent fibers under the UV light. So again, like I said before, uh, governments usually have protocols as well when you are dealing with counterfeit money. So let's say in case you do get one and you spot it later on, you can go on the government's website to see what to do next um, if you encounter such an issue. And you can also try some of these mechanisms at home. So try getting a Singaporean note today. And if in case you do have a UV light, see it under the UV light. It looks really cool. Or you can go to their website as well. Their website has a proper tutorial um, that shows people how to spot a counterfeit and how a fake, uh, sorry, how a real uh, note should look like. Again, um, Singapore is a safe country. Uh, the counterfeited notes have a very low occurrence in Singapore due to the strict measures and the features that they have embedded in their notes. So it becomes very hard to mimic or fake such a note. Um, again, just for your information, US currency is the most counterfeited currency in the world according to the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Again, I hope this was um, informative and maybe you will try out some of the mechanisms. Um, again, some of these things are universal for the currencies. Some of these things are specific to certain nations. For example, the fluorescent fibers, they're unique to the Singaporean currency. Yeah, I've heard of the UV light technique before. And dear listeners, if you ever think you've spotted a fake note, please try out these mechanisms to verify if it's a real note or a fake one. Yes. Is it possible that banks are fake? Fake banks. That's an interesting question. So Singapore has combated counterfeit money issues um, very well, but it does face an epidemic of fake banking scams. Um, these scams are known as phishing, like starting with a P. So it's P-I-S-H-I-N-G, similar to phishing, but with a P, phishing. So what happens over here is, in essence, it would be very difficult to pull off a full real-life running fake bank scam. Uh, where we're talking about a proper premises and it's operating and then the next day, you know, it disappears. Uh, that's an elaborate scam. Um, so far, I haven't heard about real fake banks, if you understand what I mean. But phishing is something that's real. And it's a very big problem that is happening within Singapore as well. So what happens over here is... Um, that fake banks, you can say they exist via platforms on the internet. So you have the internet scams, the telephone calls, the text messages, the fake emails. Um, and most of the time, it's very hard to tackle this problem because 90% of the perpetrators behind these scams are overseas. So it's hard to track them. It's hard to arrest them. It's hard to get them at them. According to the Singapore police force, um, since May, like the May that we just um, had, at least 10 people have fallen prey to phishing and lost accumulated of $70,000. So this is just recent stats over here. So what happens in these scams? So what will happen is that you can receive a phone call from a person impersonating the bank staff or an SMS claiming that you have issues with your debit card or credit card. Uh, you have, you know, like one day to call us back to resolve this issue or your card will be declined. Or people who are calling you, they will come up with a genuine excuse 
and scare you as well so that you actually do what they tell you to do at that moment. Now, what they're actually trying to do is they are trying to get hold after they hook you and you're listening and you don't understand that it's fake. Um, what they try to do is they try to get your details from you. Details like what is your card number? What is your account number? What is your date of birth? Your personal information. Now, you need to understand that most of the banks um, do not ask for certain information. For example, your OTP number. So after getting all of your details, they will say, okay, you will get an OTP number on your phone. We need to use that now. Some poor people do not understand that. They will give out their OTP number. And the next thing that you know is you get a message on your phone saying, a transaction of so many thousand dollars has occurred from your bank. And then you understand that you were part of a big scam. Unfortunately, bank personnel will never ask for your OTP number. Again, for these things, uh, it has been taking place in Singapore. They're trying to combat it. Um, what the government does and the banks do is, again, they create awareness so that a lot of people are aware that these things are happening. In case they get emails, I've gotten several as well over here from my bank, like claiming to be my bank. But again, um, they tell you of different mechanisms to see if it is phishing or not. If you're aware, then it's more likely that you do not fall for a scam. So that's one thing that the Singapore government is good at. They make people aware. Next time you go to the MRT station, do look out. So you will see several ads, you know, like watch out for a scan. There's phishing happening. Look out for the emails that you're getting. Again, if you go to their website, um, they will advise you as how to recognize phishing. How do you know an email is fake? How do you know a, a message that's coming is fake? How do you know a phone call that you're receiving is fake? I also see the posters and they say, if it's a plus six, five number, it's a fake. Mm -hmm. and, and then like, you and I get phone calls saying, hello, this is Ministry of Health. This is regarding COVID. And then the second I listen to the first two seconds, I'm like, bye-bye. And I decline. <laughs> okay well done see you're a smart boy you are aware and you know how to handle those scams well done thank you can you share a little bit about your experience of being a lecturer at a university okay my lecturing days so i have lectured for over eight years now at a university before lecturing in Pakistan, I was also um, teaching in UK. So it was at a college. Um, so I actually started my teaching from there. So at a college in UK, from there I came to Pakistan. And in Pakistan, I started um, my career as a professional banker. Um, and then I uh, switched over to lecturing again. But it was a wonderful experience, I have to say, um, because over the years, I've met so many amazing individuals from different backgrounds, with different personalities. Um, if I look at myself now, you know, teaching, I was learning, um, I was growing, I was evolving, and I was challenging myself every day. So for example, like you, Mr. Radon, you know, like you're asking me questions, so I have to be, you know, um, on my toes of how do I answer? I need to have information. I need to have the knowledge. It was the same in that period of time. So my game had to be top level. So I had to do a lot of research. I had to know about a lot of things um, going on, current uh, things, as well as book knowledge, as well as things that are coming from the industry. So I loved every, every bit of it. And then the best part about all of this is when the students that you've taught and they've gone to their own avenues and their own adventures in the world, 
when I hear um, or I see an email from them or I hear from them in some form or another, um, and then they're writing to me to thank me or show me gratitude. So that is the most rewarding thing about lecturing. And then what they do is they share their achievements with me. For example, achievements can be anything from landing their dream job to getting admissions in one of a prestigious university that they wanted to get into for higher education, or even things as precious as getting invitations to their wedding. So it's very heartwarming um, to know that, you know, they remembered me, they appreciated me, and then I played a minor role that impacted their lives. That was fantastic. Yeah, and I mean, it's so good that you are teaching so many young people and and helping them turn their lives into something very great. Yes, thank you. So I was actually um, uh, teaching kids of undergrad level and then um, MBA level and also executive MBAs. So I also had a privilege to teach people who are actually coming from the industry and then coming to the university to learn more. So I learned from them, they learned from me. So it was, it was a very cool experience. Yeah, it sounds so fun to be a teacher and a lecturer. You get to meet like the lots of people every day. Like, yes, that's true. Students, but you can also meet different people. Like, yeah. That's true. So in our class, in my class, we had a uh, auditorium full of a, a capacity of 60 students per class. So imagine if you do the calculation. So I've taught for more than eight years and one batch of students would be, you know, like if I take one class, it's 60 kids. And for a semester, I would be taking about three classes. So that's 180 students per semester, and there are three semesters per year, and then calculate for, you know, like about eight years. So I've met a lot of um, cool, amazing individuals, and it teaches you a lot about life as well, like how to handle different scenarios, difficult scenarios, how to handle different, you know, individuals or problems. Um, so it was a good learning curve. Yeah, that, that sounds super fun. Like. Now, it's another thing added to my list on what I want to be. I mean, like, uh-huh, I, that's awesome. I have a lot of things already, like 100 plus. Now it's 100 plus with the extra few. Oh. Awesome. That like, makes like, me happy to hear. <laughs> yeah, like now lecturing and teaching and banking. Banking was already there, but now even. Awesome. More. Yeah. That's fantastic. What made you choose to study finance? What did you want to be as a child? So um, I would say all of this credit goes to my amazing father to inculcate the love for learning, first of all, and giving education so much importance was all him. So telling you a bit about my dad, my dad was a CA, that's a chartered accountant from the UK. And he just loved to gain knowledge. So even when he had his job and we were growing up looking at him, he was always acquiring degrees and certifications and learning new things. Um, He would just be on his laptop. Okay, today I'm going to enroll myself into an MBA course online. So today I'm going to, you know, like learn about Islamic finance, for example, and then get a certification about that. So he was really um, into always learning. So, for example, me at the moment, okay, master is done, going, you know, doing your lecturing. Um, At the moment, I'm stagnant. But my dad was just dynamic. He would just learn and learn and learn. Um, He set the benchmark for us. He was very knowledgeable. He was a gem of a person. He was one of a kind. Um, Again, so I'm trying to follow his footsteps did to a certain extent and naturally I was in awe of him and he was my inspiration and as a little child uh, because I used to look up to him I also wanted to become a successful banker like him 
and sort of treaded on the same path. Uh, for example, I pursued um, accounting in my O levels and then pursued accounting in my A levels and then continued that to major in accounting in my undergrad. So uh, because my dad was a CA, that means that he was a certified accountant. Okay, from my undergrad, after learning a lot about accounting and numbers, I was always good at numbers, um, good at math, good at numbers. Um, my art C bit is not that good. Um, uh, okay, I can draw, but I'm not very imaginative, maybe. I'm more calculative, good with numbers. Um, when I did my undergrad, I developed a liking for corporate finance, especially. That somehow just intrigued me. And that resulted me into choosing finance for my postgrad um, as opposed to accounting. I thought I've done a lot of accounting. Let's expand. Let's, you know, like increase my portfolio. And then I jumped into finance. But again, all of these things are interlinked. For example, finance, economics, accounting, they're interlinked with each other. But again, very subject specified. Um, I loved every bit of my academic life. There were like the best years of my life learning. Um, but now that I think of it, um, looking back, I could have been a very good plastic surgeon too. <laughs> so a very diverse field. Um, I've done finance, I've done accounting. But if I think what I could have done as a child, not when I was a child, but now I think that I could have become a very successful plastic surgeon to be very specific as well. What makes you think that you could have been a good plastic surgeon? Fine. I don't know. I, that's a good question. I know they're very different. They're very um, opposites to each other, right? So one a medical field, one a completely industrial uh, financial field. But I actually found a friend um, who was a medical doctor and a plastic surgeon. So from someone from Iran, amazing person. Looking at her, I was like in awe, like, wow, like that's a profession that I think I could have done well. It's just a uh, inner feeling. Um, I think she inspired me. And uh, looking at people, you know, like doing something for them that gives them a confidence boost. Um, yeah, that's that's just fantastic. So I think it's more of the end result that gets you that um, that satisfaction, that gives you that satisfaction. Wow. That's, that's so inspiring how you got inspiration from her. Yes. What are your hobbies? Okay, so hobbies, again, so I have two very different um, sides to me. Like I just said, so one is like finance and one is like plastic surgeon, very different. I can yeah. say the same about hobbies. Um, so my first hobby at the moment would be I love exploring nature. So it can be anything from going for a hike a trail or just walking or even just sitting on the beach so I love to you know just look, look at the sight and the sound of the surrounding nature it's so magnificent yet so calming and surreal so that's one thing I really love doing the other part of me is an adrenaline junkie so I love to do adventurous things for example, bungee jumping, skydiving, or going on the world's fastest roller coaster. Um, I also have a good appetite for the horror genre. So it can be anything from watching horror movies to listening to scary tales to even going to haunted houses or mansions. So I'm all up for that. Um, recently, quite recently, I've developed a knack for baking. So it I just seem to love the concept of how some simplistic ingredients can bring about such beautifully scrumptious results and the whole science involved in the baking region. I just adore that. And you just learn every day. Yeah, I like 
one of those things, but the other yeah. one, I don't like. I love, <laughs> yeah, I also love going to nature. It's like a very fun thing. Yes. I'm not a horror person. I don't like horror. I'm not a horror person. I don't think many people do. So those are, again, the two sides, the two extremes, you can say. One for it is just loving nature, the calmness, the serenity. And on the other side, I love the adrenaline rush, too. Thank you so much for coming on my show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I love talking to you. And all of your fantastic questions were brilliant. So thank you for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. I I enjoyed talking to you a lot. I learned so much, like a lot. Thank you so much. And once again, like it's very nice that you taught so many young students and they made their lives like super great and successful. Oh, thank you for saying that. Yes, I would just say that it's a minor part that I play in the success that they have. And it's really rewarding when they come back to me and tell me that. Thank you for saying that. I'm, uh, yes, I, I'm glad to hear that from you. Welcome. Dear listeners, follow my Facebook page, Curious Vedant, to get updates on my upcoming episodes. To listen at leisure on your phone or get notified about future episodes, subscribe by searching for Curious Vedant wherever you get your podcasts, such as Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can also listen to my show on Curious